So uh, thank you everyone and welcome. Uh, thank you so much to, to ACO and Griffith um, for, for allowing us to be part of this today. We've got a, a really sort of big um, interest and investment, I suppose, in the idea of mixed reality, um, virtual reality, um, through through headsets, but also through technology, as you'll see, and I'm going to sort of break this presentation into a few different parts um, by way of an intro, then have a look at what's happening in K-12, then have a look at what's happening in universities around the world, and then talk about business, because I think that we're seeing some, um, the, the fruits of this work really take off, and 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 many of you on the on the call today are the ones leading the research behind this. At Microsoft, we talk about sort of three big bets, and this was a few years ago, but I put this up here because we're obviously we're only focusing on mixed reality today, but they really are informed by artificial intelligence and also compute power um, because of the uh, the way that the um, something like a HoloLens or a, 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 a holographic computer, for example, does require artificial intelligence and the use of the cloud. And so we talk about the idea of, of now these things intersecting and coming together to create this new version of technology, new form of computing, if you like, um, where ubiquitous computing through the cloud technology, artificial intelligence, but also this idea of multiple sense um, devices sort of come together. And, and so this is part of um, Microsoft's vision for how we might be able to use computers in the future, having gone through the idea of personal computers or desktop computers, laptops, those sorts of things, through mobile computers, computers whether they be smartphones, tablets, and the like, and now into what we think is, is like a third um, platform for computing, which is more around this mixed reality or virtual reality world. And I know that many of you are doing research in this space. Um, so what is mixed reality really just as a level set? Um, it really sort of is a whole spectrum between the physical world and the digital world. And it sort of straddles both of those ends. And there's different devices and different ways you can think about it. And augmented reality sort of is a bit closer to the physical world and virtual reality where you're closed off from the physical world is more towards that sort of uh, digital world side and there's lots of different technologies that sort of sit on that spectrum as you'd be familiar with and as you would have worked on. A different way of thinking about it really is to think about whether or not you know technology is portable or tethered or whether it's sort of see-through or it's opaque and that's an, a kind of a way to sort of think about the differences in these kinds of technology and where different tools that you might have used or be using sort of sit. Um, one of the interesting things that, you know, I, I consider myself a bit of a technology skeptic and, and uh, you know, in my, my history in education, I've always kind of been one who's, who's um, likes to be on the, on the bleeding edge, but I'm kind of skeptical about some technologies. And um, so I remember presenting a slide with this heading um, about three or four years ago, you know, going AR, VR, MR, is that BS? Have we worked that out yet? Um, because I think lots and lots of specially K-12 environments were buying these headsets without really having evaluated whether or not they make a difference. We know in the blue box here, you can see that there are huge potentials um, for this and the and the industry is, is, is blowing up in terms of its size around the use of these kinds of technology for lots of different, lots of different things, whether it be in education or whether it be um, outside of education, as I'll sort of end the presentation with today and talk about how that's coming to life with some some business applications of this technology. But we do now know that there's a body of growing a growing body of research, thanks to people like yourselves, which are looking at the role of VR, AR, and MR um, to uh, to look at what does it do for learning, what does it do for efficiencies, you know, how does it work in the workplace, and there is compelling evidence now that suggests that this is a, um, a valuable addition to the technology spectrum. The, um, the education scenarios is really important because it does enable different sort of scenarios or things to take place when we start using these kinds of um, um, mixed reality and virtual reality, augmented reality kind of tools. Um, so inclusive classrooms, the idea of making sure that, you know, there, there's sort of connection between people, allowing people to experience what was previously impossible, go to places, see things at a scale that they might not have seen before, um, and also the idea of distance learning. And I suppose that leads us on to this idea of what we've been through in the last few months. And I'm going to reference some examples of what's happened during the sort of COVID lockdown experience globally, when 1.6 million students couldn't actually attend formal education and were displaced from going to their physical locations for learning. 
Um, and we've seen lots of different things. We've seen, you know, there's been a desire to use these technologies for a long time, but really we've started to see a real need for this. And I'm sure that you're doing some groundbreaking work at your own institutions around the ways that you've been able to use mixed reality, for example, to think about how do we create experiential learning for, for students um, that if they can't be face to face in a lab, how can we give them the experience of some of those things? Um, one of the other things that, that these kinds of technology allow us to do if they're collaborative is to build that community, build that presence, to have conversations with people in a way that wouldn't be possible or isn't as, isn't as rich or as real or as experiential if we're just using sort of two dimensional screen based technology. And the third thing that we're seeing is that there is likely to be a massive growth in education numbers in uh, universities, probably due to the growth um, of online learning. And so we're seeing this intersect of, of these kinds of technology enabling different types of learning around the world. And these are some examples of what we've been seeing during the, um, during the COVID experience whether it's um, you know anatomy and, and cadavers, whether there's remote labs being used, um, whether it's students at New York University and University of Pennsylvania um, doing standardized nursing uh, simulations to assess students. Um, down the bottom, we've got sort of the more the virtual reality realm where we start to see you know graduations happening by alt space. And you know there's been lots of different experiential ideas, experimental ideas um, of the way these technologies might work. And so one of the things we talk about when we when we work with, because I'm the ed education industry um, lead for Microsoft across K to 12 and university, um, is we, we sort of say to, to younger students and to teachers in high schools, it's like students aren't going to get a job by just having experienced one of these technologies. We need to sort of shift the narrative in, in many of the high schools and primary schools around the world to start creating you know, creating the future, not consuming it. And so that's one of the big things that we focus on down in the junior years is to make sure that kids are actually creating for their VR headset, you know, creating things in three dimensions so that they can start to um, experience that. And so we see lots of different possibilities in terms of jobs and futures around creativity and creation. So this is um, some workers who are creating um, Defence Force um, holographic headsets um, and software out of Saab. And Saab obviously manufactured cars, but they also manufactured jets back in the day. And now they work a lot in military systems. And these workers here um, are from Adelaide and they were displaced from the automobile industry, um, which obviously in Australia has taken a hit. And so they were retrained and reskilled and they're being, um, being used to develop some of these things uh, in Adelaide. One of the things we also talk about with, um, with with um, teachers is the idea of you know scaffolding up and making sure that students have the opportunity to use to start by building the building blocks of what it creates uh, what it takes to create in three dimensions right up to what are the real high-end sort of tools or or things that you can use to create things for real and so you know one of the things around the stem initiatives we see in secondary schools is that there's um, you know there's a lot of sort of lower level things sphero balls and things to get people started but then and it's kind of not really using real world tools in senior high school. And as I wait till university until I start using these tools and we're sort of trying to say, hey, you know, students of the age of 15, 16 are interested in this, should really be starting to use some of these things like Unity 3D and some other tools to actually get to a point where they're creating and innovating at that higher level. And so we, we sort of use that to display um, that idea. So let me just take you through a couple of case studies and the rest is really stories about what we're seeing around the world in terms of these kinds of technology. Ormiston College had a set of, they have VR, they have AR, they have um, HoloLens as well. And they've been doing some really interesting work. Um, and this, this school is just out of uh, 20 minutes out of Brisbane, I suppose. Um, and so they've been doing some things like, for example, um, one of the things you can do in Minecraft Education Edition, which is a version for, um, for schools, is you can create something in three dimensions, export it as a GLB file, as a three dimensional file, and actually rotate it around and see it in, in situ, if you like, um, just using your Windows 10 computer and your camera. Um, so they were doing some project work around designing um, science, um, lab laboratories in their STEM center, um, year 10 chemistry students using HoloLens to visualize um, molecular structure, 
um, the year 10 in humanities. We're doing some stuff around app design using um, AR in partnership with a, um, the Queensland Museum to, to look at how they could create an augmented reality app that almost gave the students a, an old world camera to document what was going on in a war zone. Um, so they've, they've been doing some really interesting stuff. And the, the idea of sort of using this technology is pretty, um, you know, is, is, is not mind boggling. We can see here that there's a, hopefully you can see that, um, is that there's a uh, uh, an object there which is being rotated around. It's actually just using a Windows 10 computer, not actually a headset, but it sort of looks like it's sitting in situ. And we're starting to see also that um, when we when we think about the ways that these sorts of things are coming into education, on the right hand side is just teams, but you can actually hand in three dimensional objects now via the assignments tool in Teams native. And so we're seeing lots of different technology shifts and changes in this space um, through, um, through these, te these technologies. Um, we also see something like uh, Minecraft Earth. And so Minecraft Earth has been released and there's just a couple of screenshots there. Um, and you can just have a look on YouTube if you're interested in seeing how that works. But the idea of having an augmented reality experience in Minecraft Earth, where you can, um, you can see the other people through your device, but you can also see what they've laid in the land using Minecraft. And you can also stand within that space, as you can see in the right hand picture there with that person um, sort of presenting. We did some work as well with, um, with some students in, in Western Sydney and with the Department of Education and a group called Indigital, which is a, an Indigenous lady, uh, Michaela Jade, uh, an Indigenous startup company around augmented reality. And one of the challenges they had was that they were, um, I'm just going to unshare my screen and share it back in again, so don't, don't freak out. Um, one of, one of the things that they did was, just let me stop sharing, because I forgot to include my system audio. I knew I'd do that. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, one of the things that they decided to do was to think about how can they preserve something like Indigenous language, for example? And Indigenous language is really, really important um, and, and was being lost in part um, within some of the, the, the cultures. And so we tried to find a way to meld technology with, um, with the elders of many communities and get them to, to think about how augmented reality might work in this space. And so you can see here um, in this little video, I'll just let it play for about 20 seconds and then I'll stop it. In the world's largest cultural landscape, we're breaking tech startup rules. Aboriginal peoples in a 20 million hectare co-working space have built the world's newest technology to bring ancient knowledge to life. From rock art to 3D augmented reality. And so the work there was really for um, for the elders to partner with students and they created these little cards here, which I don't know whether you can see, but these little cards where you'd hover your phone over with an app and it would create, you know, turn into an augmented reality experience. But the interesting thing in terms of learning was that the students were in charge of the technology. They would draw the characters using 3D paint on their device. Um, and then the elders were responsible in helping them translate the story of that character into the language um, to think about the music. Uh, and it was a great collaboration between not only technology, but of course, um, the, the communities that were um, working in that, in that space. And so some really, really interesting outcomes of that in um, around um, in engaging Indigenous communities. We're also seeing some stuff around buildings. So this is actually from Denmark, I think, Netherlands, um, where they're looking at the way they can use something like HoloLens to help instruct um, builders. And you might have seen, if I switch to a more higher ed version, you might have seen this work out of RMIT, and there might be someone from RMIT on the call, where they've used the sort of Holo HoloLens experience to think about the way that our um, architecture might be changed. And the fact that, 
you know, thing, things that the, the, the problem with uh, building stuff is that it comes out of someone's brain. It then has to be put into two dimensional drawings and then it has to be made 3D again by a skilled builder. And so the challenge in that translation is obviously one of the biggest battles between architects and, and builders that we see. And so this is an idea of being able to use HoloLens to kind of allow the builders to be really um, hugely accurate in terms of where they're placing things. This is the UTS building. There may be someone from UTS um, on the screen on the uh, call too. And the UTS building is fascinating because of the way that the brickwork has been done there. However, when you don't have a straight wall, bricklayer productivity goes down about 90%. So, so we start to see real challenges with this beautiful building, which kind of looks like a crumpled cardboard bag, but the inefficiencies with building that are huge. And so University of Tasmania did some, did some work with um, Colin here on the right hand side and um, and Colin was is a um, is a builder, and you can see that there's some sort of holographic um, placeholders there, if you like, for where the bricks would be. So he and his apprentice, and there's a little video here. So when I share the slides, you can grab that video and have a look. But it's about how to create that sort of curved wall perfectly, because no brick, as he describes, is actually straight with any other brick when you're building something like that. And so we're starting to see even um, areas such as brick laying, believe it or not be disrupted or be impacted by this kind of technology to allow greater efficiencies. And he said they were able to build this day at uh, this brick wall in, I think it was two days, which normally would have taken weeks to structure if they were just doing it by eye because you can't use string lines and so forth. We've obviously seen in the university setting things around um, being able to use um, mixed reality in, in the classroom settings. And so this is uh, Dr. David Kellerman, UNSW um, engineering lecturer. Um, and he, they look that this little um, machine they've got on the left hand side of that picture is in the lab. The problem with it being in the lab is the lab's a pretty small place. It's also a bit of a dangerous place and it tests the, the strength of certain materials. And there are lots of people more qualified to talk about that than me. Um, but what he really wanted to do was to think about how he could get um, this experience of this machine um, to all of his students. And, and at first year, he has something like a thousand students in his class. And so he used that um, Azure Connect device is what it's called, that little white box there, which is a, a now a, a device from Microsoft, which allows you to, to create three-dimensional models of things in real time. And actually in his scenario, have it projected into the classroom. And sorry about the dodgy screenshot there, but I got it from a, a, a PDF Prezo that he uh, sent. The, um, the idea being that in the context of a lecture, they can have a chat about the, um, the, the tool on the left hand side there, do the mathematical or engineering work associated with what they think might happen. And then this is a real time working model of it actually happening in the lab at that time, but it's being shown there in the lecture theater. So those who are in the lecture theater are watching up on the screen and those who are on, online are experiencing it kind of like we are seeing there. And so they can actually play out or test out their, their mathematical theory um, in reality in the lab without trying to crunch a thousand people into a small room with dangerous equipment. So there's lots of um, ways that that little sort of connect sensor and that connect sensor, by the way, um, some of you may have had an Xbox back in the day with a little connect thing on it with some cameras that allows you to sort of play ping pong without a controller. Um, that, this is sort of the iteration of that now. It's a cloud connected device that allows um, customers and companies to start to think about how they can model things in three dimension and turn things into mixed reality. Um, University of Wollongong, Wollongong hello if you're, if you're out there, um, doing some fantastic work and you can see a link down the bottom there which you can have a look at later on of some videos where they're looking at the similar idea. Some machinery here, um, building it up in Blender, um, using Unity to then turn it into a three-dimensional object and then putting it in situ, <coughs> which allows people to sort of, the students to start experimenting with it, lifting little weights and putting them on the bottom and thinking about the, um, the ways that sort of materials react when under pressure. Um, the, the key benefits of this really are removal of risk uh, for the people using it and, um, um, and, and damage to the machinery improve safety for those using it and also the um, they can scale up simulations without once again having many people in the in the room squashed in around that. I just wanted to show you this. This is um, some of the work that's happening out of Case Western University and you may have if you followed this space for a while, which I'm sure many of you have, you may be aware that Case Western University have um, partnered with Microsoft pretty heavily over since about 2015 um, to work with us to think about how holographic technology might be used in the teaching of anatomy. And so 
Um, this is a video that's just been released um, during COVID um, about the way that they used it. So I'll just play that and uh, be back with you shortly. ever done anything like it before. With each lobar bronchi or secondary bronchi subdivides into five bronchopulmonary segments in each of the lower lobes. Now these bronchopulmonary segments are the smallest functional Stay safe, wash your hands, and I look forward to seeing you as soon as possible. And so Case Western have, um, have done a fair bit of work in that in the development of the hollow anatomy um, experience over over a while. This is actually, so this these captures here are of a colleague of mine, Lawrence Crumpton, who's based in Sydney, actually taking part in one of those live anatomy classes, which they ran in March. Um, and so he was, a, it was a midnight or two in the morning or something for him, but he was basically taking part in the anatomy class via a HoloLens, um, as were the students. They shipped 185 HoloLenses out to first year students. I think they, had any, and they ran them in a couple of cohorts and they had 90 people online at once experiencing the same thing with being led by Professor Suwish Baratz. Um, interestingly, um, Professor Suwish Baratz was actually a, um, uh, a real skeptic about this when she started because she's obviously the anatomy expert, <coughs> obviously very used to the use of cadavers and so forth. Uh, in 2015, she was sort of like, I'm not sure this is going to work. And even if it does work, I'm not even sure it's going to be impactful for the learners. And so here she is a few years later, actually teaching her first remote anatomy class to beaming into students houses when they can't come to the lab for her classes. The interesting thing is around the, um, the results of this. One thing is, and you can see that study there, is the reduction in time to learning an um, anatomy without sacrificing exam scores. So they did some testing and it was four and a half hours using a HoloLens and 7.3 hours if using a cadaver um, to actually have that experience that was required to learn the didactics around anatomy that they needed to learn, but there wasn't any deficiencies in terms of the student's ability. More anecdotally speaking, it hasn't been published yet, but from what we're what we're hearing from the professors just in the last you know, month or so is that students who are supplementing traditional cadaver learning with a HoloLens are actually having 80% improved re recall and retention of that data. And more interesting than that is when they didn't have a cadaver experience at all and they only had HoloLens, they were still having improvements of about 50% in terms of their recall and um, retention in terms of anatomy. Now that's really interesting and I don't think we would ever want to, um, you know, um, begrudge students the opportunity in, in anatomy or in medicine studies to have that cadaver experience. But I think there's some potential maybe for reducing the amount of time and we know that huge costs, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and some of you would be experts on that more than I am, go into maintaining those kinds of labs um, where, where anatomy students go in. And the possibility of using those labs in a different way being supplemented by some holographic experiences is a pretty attractive thing for a university to think about. And so we'll wait um, and see those results be, be published. If I just go future a little bit and start thinking less about higher education and more about um, uh, the workforce. You may have seen this video before and if you haven't just do a uh, YouTube search for HoloLens and Autodesk and I think you'll find it. But basically what you can see here is you've got a person using a HoloLens but they're obviously on a computer using Holo, um, using Autodesk there to do their sort of creation of that 3D model. But here is actually a holographic model sitting on the table of that what they're designing and what that allows a designer to do is to make some changes up here which are going to be reflected in that model in real time down there. 
And so that's really interesting because it means that you are kind of seeing a 3D representation of something you're creating by, by changing the code and the software, but you're seeing it change in real time. Now, if we turn that on its head and think about that in reverse, in this right hand picture here, you can see that they had a chassis of a motorbike on, this was done on stage as a presentation, chassis of a motorbike, which they holographically layered his design on top of. And so now that chassis had the motorbike on top of it. And so those, that mirror, he was able to manipulate that mirror just using gestures and his HoloLens. And the nice thing about that is that when he manipulated that, it would update the code in the software um, to make sure that it represented. So you've got this two way, um, you've got this two way interaction for a designer. The other interesting thing this throws up for me is maybe it means that the designers don't actually have to be an expert in CAD or um, Autodesk or whatever other serious software tools that they're using. So because you could just manipulate things with your hands almost more like a sculptor and have the software producing the code in the background. So we're seeing some really interesting um, experiences around that. <coughs> this is one um, which was filmed in the labs in Microsoft um, a little while ago and it's it's about hollow portation and I'll show you how this is sort of um, coming to life uh, now, but this is um, obviously a, la a, a setting over here with his, this, it's that man's daughter and she's in another lab and you can see that there's the, the little stool in the same spot and the little block of woods in the same spot in both areas to kind of mirror the environment. And then uh, on the right hand side, what you're seeing and, and it's kind of like we're wearing a HoloLens too, is that he's looking down and he can see a hologram of his daughter walking around and they're actually talking together and whatever, but from separate rooms. And so we're seeing this as an idea around hollow portation, you could say, which is coming alive in um, different settings. And let me give you a few examples of that. <coughs> the World Congress, Mobile World Congress in 2019, Mattel, who is the toy manufacturer, and Spatial, who are a, um, a technology uh, company who are building in this space, uh, spatial are sort of creating almost like a, a three-dimensional collaboration space for people to work together. And so the gentleman you can see up here is actually a holographic representation of another presenter standing in another lab somewhere else around the world, but he can see the people because he's wearing a HoloLens too, although his avatar isn't. He can see, he can see the person who's on stage to the right-hand side, and there's another gentleman on the left-hand side. Uh, once again, go to YouTube and have a look. Um, but the idea is that they're being able to manipulate models uh, in three dimensions across uh, two different spaces in real time. Um, the other thing that you can see here is that the guy on the right hand side sort of adds a little note on his mobile device and then sort of flicks it up and it, it turns into a holographic note, which then they can pin onto that toy as a bit of feedback. And of course, everyone who's then experiencing it holographically can, um, can start to interact on that object. So we're starting to see large companies, <coughs> excuse me, like Mattel and others start to use this tool like Spatial to brainstorm over distance, to think creatively over distance, to open up different ideation boards, and to also see representations of models they're working on and pass them by people who can't be physically in the same space. In Australia, there's a company in Perth called Silverchain, and what they're doing is creating this experience for medicine. And so you can see on the left hand side, obviously this gentleman either can't make it to a um, specialist appointment, lives too far away, maybe is immobile, maybe is disabled. There, there's reasons why people can't make it, maybe he doesn't drive anymore. Um, there's a reason why people can't make it to a medical center to see their specialist, or maybe it's a specialist that is only, you know, available in Melbourne and this man lives in, in Perth or whatever. The, the idea here is that a nurse would go to his house with a HoloLens experience and then he would actually see his doctor face to face by, by fire a hologram. The advantage is that... Go, Travis. Okay, the advantage that that gives you is the idea that there's a face to face connection between the two people. So that's nice for people to have, but also the fact that the doctor can present um, objects, um, diagrams, explanations into the um, into the um, field of view of the patient to talk them through what's happening, which is normally done on a, a fairly dodgy sketch on a piece of paper or one of the models that a, a doctor grabs off a shelf when you're in their office. So this is something that they're, they've worked on now um, and it's it really could be a revolutionary uh, experience for people in remote areas to get healthcare.
Another example um, is called Hollow Patient, and this was actually film a uh, photo taken a couple of years ago um, in a in a room, and you can see here that Lawrence, um, the presenter, <coughs> is wearing a Hololens. He's actually looking at this chair here, which has got no one in it, but you can see on the screen what he's actually seeing. And so he's seeing a patient there and he's seeing the vital statistics of that patient. Um, and there's there's some really interesting ideas here around, you know, how do you, what happens when you are in a simulation environment? And I know in education, there might be some examples for this as well. You know, um, student teaching, I taught in the education faculty and student teaching is the richest time of learning for teachers because they actually get in front of 25 little humans who are slight, slightly unpredictable. And so the amount of decisions they make, you know, that scenario based stuff, you cannot replace. You can't teach for that. But maybe there is a way to teach for those sorts of scenarios like a patient getting more ill and suddenly declining um, in terms of vital statistics or a, or a group of students doing something in a classroom that could be possible through holographic technology moving forward. So this is where it comes to the, the title of the presentation. And um, you know you've, you probably know about the Gartner hype cycle, the, the idea that all technology sort of goes through this trigger point past the peak of inflated expectations down through the trough of disillusionment, which is one of my favorite expressions ever, and then starts to eventually come up and then become hit the plateau of productivity. And I think that some people still think that we're at the peak of inflated expectations with this technology and that we've still got to go through that trough and then push on. But I'm going to show you some things that are um, happening in the real world in business with technology. This is the hype cycle from 2018. And you can see here's mixed reality. It was actually ducking down then. And uh, uh, virtual assistants, uh, something else, uh, augmented reality was a little bit ahead. Um, but you can see that they were sort of right down the bottom at that point and were sort of making their way up to the um, plateau then. This is a um, uh, an example of some work that's happening uh, at Microsoft. And let me just uh, play this for a second and then um, I'll come back. Work today is more comfortable. Now employees can learn by doing. This is a tool that works with existing processes, allowing a manager to get the right guides to their people. The instructions move with the employees, pointing them to the tools and parts they need, showing them exactly where they need to apply them. Employees get up to speed faster with fewer errors and more confidence. A simple glance moves so that's an idea of, of some of the ways that are starting to see this technology be used. And this is actually available in what's called Microsoft Dynamics. And Dynamics is kind of an ERP um, enterprise system that allows you to do lots of different aspects of running business. Um, and, and so Dynamics at 365 is actually a product where you can start to, to use these tools. And there are some different ways that you can build this into the workplace right now. And companies are doing this at the moment. I'll show you a few more studies, case studies on it. Um, one is remote assistance. You can see on the left-hand side, the idea that you could have experts from somewhere else beam into a physical location and actually show a person how to do something. And when you think about the amount of uh, manufacturing going on, you think about airlines, you think about lots of different scenarios where you can't always have the key engineers on site, there's possibilities for you to start thinking about remote assistance. It could be someone out in the field who's fixing a lift or who's fixing a, a um, some sort of bit of machinery um, out, in the, out in the field somewhere who needs to beam back into the office. But instead of it being just a mobile phone call, it might actually be a holographic um, uh, call where they can guide you actually in situ on the uh, on the object you're working on. There's train and, uh, training and, and guidance. There's these things called Dynamics 365 Guides, which is actually creates not only these end guides, which show people how to do things in, in situ, but also it, it gives them the technology to be able to create these guides from scratch. And so they can have these arrows and whatever in holographic land and they can pull them down and they can actually build the guides standing beside a machine. And then that can, can be the, the making of training material. Collaborative, vi go. collaborative visualization is another area. Um, where you can start to have multiple people sort of seeing things in space. And the last one that we're seeing it being used for um, for companies who are starting to use this is con contextual data being overlaid across things like a factory floor. And you can see here that the, there's probably an example in the furthest right hand side picture of where um, you know the most traffic is and when we think about that and overlaying that data they may have, but putting it in situ is really, really interesting and important.
And so when we think about training in, in the context of the way this is working in the world now, we're seeing like improvements in skilling, efficiencies, uh, empowering for the frontline workers to sort of do their best work in situ uh, on their own. Lots of different examples of the way that this mixed reality technology is being built in for businesses to improve um, um, the way that they're working. And so you can see here that sort of heads up help and support where the HoloLens of the guy on the left is actually um, sending a video picture to the guy who's on the other end. So he can actually see what the guy wearing the HoloLens is seeing and can start to sort of write in space and help him out. We might see sort of the, the idea of contextualizing data around machinery in a factory to get a summary while you walk around of how's this machine performing, how's this machine performing. Um, this is actually from Qantas here in Australia where they're starting to use it for training of, of pilots. Um, and there's a different way we think about training when we have sort of this holographic technology to help us. For example, you might have a physical twin, which is a completely holographic version of something you want people to learn on. So it might be the cockpit in this case, which is a completely holographic cockpit, a physical twin of what a cockpit's like so they can start to learn it. The second way you can think about this being used in reality is overlaying uh, holographic um, items across the top of a physical object. And we saw that in the example of the machinery having some sort of things being uh, holographically overlaid on it to help a user. And the third um, one the third thing that, that would happen is that there's likely to be, you know, less expensive errors. If someone makes a mistake, you don't want to have a pilot just sort of learn by going into the, into the air for the first time. They use lots of different existing simulations to do that. But in terms of machinery too, you're sort of giving them the experience with a physical twin, then they get hands on with a machine with some overlaying information. And thirdly, they can go to some machine. And so we're seeing Qantas here in Australia using um, holographic technology. And the last story um, I wanted to share with you was about the work that's been happening with Philips. And Philips is, um, you may or may not know, but there's lots that make a lot of medical equipment. And so now they're exploring the idea of almost making a heads up display for surgeons. Um, and you can see here on the left hand side that there is a, um, a surgeon there performing an operation and, and passing a, a wire um, straight through a patient's body. And you can see they've got the little wire here. And that little yellow line there, which I've just drawn a red line on, is actually showing them in situ where that little camera or device is actually um, tracking through uh, into the person's body in front of them. And when we think on the right hand side, you know, when you're conducting surgery, to have a heads up display is something else they're thinking about with those vitals sort of being right in the eye line of just a glance up. Um, for a surgeon rather than looking over to several monitors. Um, you can see the monitors sort of behind the surgeon there on the left hand side, all of which is vital information, sometimes for the anaesthetist, sometimes for the nurses, but sometimes for the actual surgeon. And so they're looking at the way they might be able to create heads up displays to provide not only more accurate information for surgeons who are doing an operation, but also that sort of those vital statistics and information being able to float into the field of view of a, um, a surgeon as they are performing a surgery. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, hopefully that was that was a useful journey through K to 12, higher ed, and now what we're seeing in business. But I suppose the idea is that this stuff is this is real. You know, there are companies all over the world who are actually investing in, you know, that Dynamics 365 piece and using that technology to improve efficiencies for their for their businesses. So thank you, first of all, for the work that universities have done in terms of pushing this technology through because we're starting to see some real gains at the other end in terms of businesses. Thank you. Look, uh, thanks Travis, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, what a plethora of information and uh, activities happening around the globe. Uh, Travis, I mean, I've, I've been asked this question by people uh, within my department and, and other universities I've worked with. How does one actually get to partner with Microsoft and something like this? Yeah, it's um it is possible to do. It's um there's there's it's it's usually the you know the the barrier to entry is usually fairly high, um so that's one of the challenges we see. But we do have a guy Lawrence who you saw in one of those videos who works full time on this on this space in partnerships. So we we approach us and and tell us about some of your ideas about what you what you want to do, uh, what you're interested in creating. We know that there's a plethora of ideas out there of what people want to do. So so make sure that you come to us and we can sort of sound it out and see if there is something that we can do together and um, and and uh, progress your idea forward. Yeah, so just just in terms of the case of Greater Western, is it, is, yep. 
did, did Microsoft, you said Microsoft partnered with Greater Western. Yeah. Does that mean they gave them the, the headsets or Western bought the headsets? Uh, I that think work? that, yeah, I think they bought the headsets. I think the partnership was really sort of back in 2015 when HoloLens was becoming a thing. And yeah. so they, they, they worked with um, uh, Case Western University quite a bit at that time to think about the possibility of this in, in anatomy teaching. And so that Holo Anatomy app was done in partnership between the professors and experts around anatomy at Case Western and the technology folks at Microsoft who were able to put that pull that together. And so yeah. it's been an ongoing partnership. But in terms of the actual, you know, 185 Holo lenses they shipped out, I, I don't know whether that was a Microsoft investment or a university investment. I'm afraid. Sorry. Yeah, and that's fine. I'm just pushing the boundaries here to see what yeah, we can I can, see what, I can see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a Q&A session, guys. Uh, so if you're on your team site, you see a little um, uh, question mark box down the bottom it says show Q&A. Uh, if you hover over the bottom there, uh, we've got Simone in that space who's been monitoring questions. So Simone, have we got any questions there for Travis? At this point, no, actually, we don't. I've put the call out and no one's taken me up on that. So questions are open if anybody's got any anything that they'd like to ask Travis. Maybe people weren't exactly sure where to find that. So just letting you know, if you hover down the click on the click on your screen, then hover down to the Q&A uh, section there. I'm sure well, I, I can keep Travis going all day, so it's OK if you don't have any questions. But uh, <laughs> so uh, we've at uh, Griffith, and I, I know a number of people in Australia have uh, been very familiar with the work that um, David Kellerman's been doing. I um, mean, he's a fairly unique individual, yeah, and so yeah. yeah, he's got a he's got a motivation, a drive to things like that. Is is there kind of features within these people who do this stuff that kind of make it more possible? I mean, it's I'm sure not everybody's a David Kellerman, so they kind of you know. How did people get into this? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, he he is uh, he is an amazing, you know, thinker, I suppose, and and has has done a presentation looking at, um, for example, you know, nine different projects that he's running at the moment. And um, so a couple of things happen. He's a, he's absolutely an amazing thinker. He has a real passion for, you know, for example, the stuff they did about bots and and the uh, AI stuff within Teams. Um, was was actually, you know, from his passion about creating student community in lectures of a thousand students, which he had in his first year engineering courses. And then that sort of kickstarted. And then once people saw his tenacity, um, I suppose, and his passion for it, um, people at Microsoft got involved and and started to help that that come to fruition. And then he worked with partners to create that and the AI in there and machine learning aspect of what's pretty Pretty amazing, really. The then then the further project sort of flew, uh, flowed on from that, like the one that I showed with the um, holographic rendition or, or version of the um, uh, the um, testing machine that was sits in the lab. There's and and so there's other projects too, you know, that that have been involved in. So I suppose one of the one of the advantages that he's had eventually is being, you know, vis visible within someone like Microsoft who are saying, we've got this other idea. I wonder who we could partner with. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, he's an amazing thinker and I suppose his tenacity and passion um, for this stuff is is obviously shining through. Yeah, cool. Okay, yeah. now I believe we have some questions, Simone. We do. So Hugh had, has asked, he can see Microsoft is putting a lot of time and money into education, but can you tell us about how they see the size of the market in dollar terms? Oh, gee, I don't know whether I would know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, it is it is huge. Um, let me just see whether I've whether I've got that as, as a hidden slide somewhere in my presentation. Um, so you don't need to show my slides again, of course. Um, yeah, it's it's absolutely huge. The the possibility of this or the the size of this in the market um, is is massive. The potential of it, I mean, the savings are, are huge too that companies are making. For example, um, Lockheed Martin, who I think and someone will know better than me, make some like make parts of um, engines. I think for aircraft, they you know through their work with Hololens made a thirty eight dollar saving per unit um, of this object that they create. For, for one of the things that they sell. And $38 per unit doesn't sound a lot until you realize that they sell 2 million of those um, around the world. And so then you start to see the economy of scale that they're experiencing, um, which is, you know, 
a huge, um, you know, 70 plus million dollar saving um, in, in, in that alone. We're seeing the, um, you know, the market for this is absolutely massive and we're seeing lots and lots of um, companies starting to use this kind of technology to improve efficiencies. Japan Airlines, for example, use the HoloLens technology to train, um, to train their engineers when someone like um, Rolls-Royce uh, release, releases a new jet engine. Um, instead of having all of their engineers from all over the world go to a certain place to experience a piece of training, they start by doing um, holographic versions of that engine that sits on the table in front of them. They can blow it up full size, they can look under it, they can open hatches. Um, there are lots of different ways that they're making massive savings too. But in terms of a dollar amount of the size of the market, it would be billions, but I'm not quite sure what the figure is. I can get back to you if you like. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Travis. Uh, listen, we're running, uh, we've run ourselves yep. out of time here in terms of this session, but there are some questions in the Q and A section. Yep. If you wouldn't mind popping into that section and um, after, so we're just going to have a five minute break, yep. so people go to the loo and make a cup of tea or whatever it is. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes. You'll need to navigate back to the front of the team site or, uh, to get into the round table channel. And in there, we'll be able to do the same. We'll get into a team site and do that uh, Q&A thing around what you're doing at your institutions. Now, just by the way, Travis, when you go down that kind of, um, you know, the decline, if you don't make it back up onto the plateau, you actually go down to the pit of abject remorse. They missed that on, <laughs> on the illustration. So. You should publish a new version. That's brilliant. I, I love the, the I additional did, emotive of language. In terms of Second Life, but then Second Life made a resurgence. So I, yeah, it did. I had to eat my words. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Travis. Look, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And if you could answer those questions in there, that'd be fantastic. Otherwise, I will. if you haven't got a question here, please take a break for a sec and we'll see you back here uh, at 25 past. Beautiful. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.